Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Lincoln, Illinois, on the trail of famous authors. And this is a good place to be because at this corner behind me is where the old Central School used to be, where Langston Hughes, famous poet, is said to have written his first poem. And to commemorate that, you're looking at a plaque here, which has been here for several years. And the lady who got this plaque, along with some help from others, Margaret Pfeiffer, uh, to commemorate not only Langston Hughes, but two other famous uh, writers as well, both spent time in Lincoln, Illinois, yes. and have roots here, yes. which is a, a, yes. a fascinating, yes. fascinating yes. thing. Now, when you learned that Langston Hughes had gone to school here, it was only a year, but when you learned he'd gone to school here as a young, as a kid, and started writing poetry here, it got the wheels going, didn't it? Oh, it certainly did, because I'm a high school English teacher, and I used to have kids, you know, memorize this, so I'd make them stand up, hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, <laughs> life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field. Uh, uh, life is a barren field, frozen, frozen with, with snow. snow. And I, no matter what, grade school, high school, college, I made college kids memorize uh -huh. that. So anyway, yeah, I yeah. was, I was sort of, I was excited. So you got, that. okay, so that got your wheels to turn. Okay, now we got to commemorate this. And then in your work, you found also about William Maxwell, and you found out about, uh, about other individuals yes, as well. Yes. Um, and so this placking started. This is not just a piece of cake, is it? You don't no. just determine you're going to do no, this. No, no. No, it takes a lot of research. You, I mean, when you go through the historical society, it's like they have to make sure you're not making this up. <laughs> yeah. There's some old lady who wants to say this. <laughs> so uh, they check everything. So it was really, it took us from when Henry and I started the committee, uh, after Paul Gleason had told me that, uh, it took us like eight years to get this far because we had to collect, it was, well, it cost over $2,000. Mm -hmm. You had to have, you know, and I, you know, and also this, you know, uh, we had to prove that he went to school here. There was no, yeah. there was no, they said, I guess they burned or something. There was no record that he went yeah, here. Yeah. So. But you finally did. You finally yeah. got it sorted out. Yes. And uh, we're, we're, during this program, what we're, that's what we're going to do. We're going to choose these three people. Langston Hughes will be our first stop. We have some yeah. people who know all about him. William Maxwell, a uh, famous author and editor. We're going to learn about him. We're also going to learn about Reinhold Niebuhr. Niebuhr who was a pastor whose whole family was pastors and actually became what was called the Trap Family of Theology. So thank you, Margaret, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Okay, thank, thank you, Mark. <laughs> Henry Johnson, mm -hmm. in the process of putting all this, doing all this research for this project, for, yes. for the plaques, um, you learn a lot about Langston Hughes. Indeed. And even though he was only in Lincoln for one year, there was a lot of there, there was a lot of trail left, wasn't there? Because he would mm -hmm. he would send things back to Lincoln. Uh, he surely did. He certainly remembered Lincoln all his life, didn't he? He got a very good start here, mm -hmm. inspired by a wonderful teacher named Ethel Welsh, and uh, he sent some books back after he became famous as a writer, remembering that she inspired him to greatness. Mm -hmm. um, one of the books is here, uh, written in from New York in 1929. It reads, For my teacher and friend, Miss Welch, these poems of Harlem, the sea and everywhere, sincerely, Langston Hughes. Could you show us the, the front of the book? Show us the front of the book. Okay, mm -hmm. this is the, and this the, is the book that he sent to, uh -huh. to Mrs. Welch. And actually, we have a very grainy picture of Mrs. Welch, but yes. this is her in her elderly years. She taught him one year, and he credits her with giving him an interest in poetry. Mm -hmm. And he was the class poet, he said. The class poet. <laughs> yeah, he said that um, in his book, The Big C, um, he wanted to honor all of the teachers, especially Mrs. Welsh, and uh, the class, his students and, and uh, classmates, that is, mm -hmm. and also just the whole environment where he, he was learning so much about poetry and about writing. And so he said he crafted 16 lines, uh, eight dedicated to the teachers in the school and then eight dedicated to his classmates and, and, and other students. And um, he said he had to cut it down a bit because it was mm -hmm. a bit much. But he did such a great job that at the end of the poem, 
uh, in his writing in the Big C, and he says that he got a standing ovation. I wish we had a copy of that Doesn't actual poem. Doesn't he say poem. somewhere that he wrote his first poem in mm -hmm. the eighth grade at Lincoln? Yes. So yes. that was his first poem? That was his first poem, but we don't have a copy mm -hmm. of his first poem, but we do have a copy of his name in the graduation list uh, of, let's see, 1916. He graduated from the uh, Central School. In fact, we have and a picture of that school. Let me show that. We have a picture of the school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, this is, uh, this is no longer there. No longer there. Uh, but for his eighth grade, this is where Langston Hughes went to, went to elementary, yes. uh, junior high school, right? Junior high school, mm -hmm. yeah. And Mrs. Welch, of course, was his teacher, yeah. as we've said. As I mentioned, uh, uh, we did find, our committee that has found uh, a record of Langston's name in the graduation list. Uh, one of the committee members, Russell Allen, mm -hmm. uh, came here to the library and found the record. So we can validate that he actually was here, of course, yeah. and in the graduation class. And in fact, we have photographs of him here in mm -hmm. Lincoln. Yes. In this photograph down here, he's with his mother. With and, the, his mother. and the caption here is at in Lincoln, Illinois. It yes. would have been at the age of uh, about 13 or 14, mm -hmm. I guess. Indeed. And there's another picture of him here. He's up in the upper left here. Mm -hmm. With his, mm -hmm. um, let's see, What's his mother, name? his uh, stepfather, his uh, stepbrother, mm -hmm. and a, a friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And About then the these, and these precious books that he sent back. Read us another one, will you, that, that yes. uh, he sent back to Mrs. Welsh. Well, this one was written from Atlanta University. Let's, let's see the cover of it first. Mm -hmm. Okay, Fields of Field Wonder. Of Wonder. Uh -huh. Written from Atlanta University, March 17th, 1947. For my teacher, Ethel Welch, with happy memories of our eighth grade where my first poem was written. Well, there you go. There you go. There you go. Lang sincerely, Langston. Sincerely, Langston. And show us this one, too. And then <laughs> one more. And let's see the cover first. Entitled One Way one Ticket. One Way Ticket. A very Merry Christmas to my teacher, Miss Ethel Welch. Sincerely, Langston. Written from New York, 1948. 1948. By mm -hmm. 1948, he'd already been famous for 20-some years, I guess, hadn't he? Yes. One of the great Harlem Renaissance mm -hmm. uh, African-American poets and writers. He wrote not only poems, but he also wrote plays and uh, was a world traveler. And uh, here in the Big C, which is, I guess, his autobiography. Yes. He notes in here, and you were telling this story a little bit, but we have it, we mm -hmm. have it uh, outlined here. So my first poem was about the longest poem I ever wrote, mm -hmm. 16 verses. And then he goes on to say, so at graduation, when I read the poem, naturally, everybody applauded loud, loudly. Yes. That was the way I began to write poetry. And it was here. Yes. It was here. Yes. Fascinating. Fascinating. I, my daughter went to that same school. Mm -hmm. Uh, not as a junior high school, but it was a grade school when she graduated, and she is now um, a doctor, a, cl a clinical psychologist practicing in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. But like Langston Hughes, she was inspired by great teachers uh, there, and one day, one day in the future, maybe there will be a plaque to her name mm -hmm. because there have been some wonderful educators over the years there that have inspired yeah young people to go on to greater things, like Langston Hughes, like my daughter, Dr. Ebony Webb, so. Okay, well thank you, sir. It's thank been, you, it's, been it's my pleasure. Appreciate it. My absolute pleasure, thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. Just about two blocks from the Langston Hughes site is the boyhood home of William Maxwell. He lived here for 10 years. William Maxwell penned 14 books, won a National Book Award, and was the editor of fiction at the New Yorker for 40 years. This is where he grew up. William Keepers Maxwell, Jr., born in Lincoln, Illinois, and stayed, uh, remained here until he was about 14 years old, huh? became a very, very uh, famous author and editor. Yes. And you, Richard, as, as the uh, librarian here, thought it was important, if you've got a local writer of that stature, Yes. To, to, to recognize him, and that's what the bust is all about. Absolutely. Uh, this was uh, dedicated here in the library in 2011 by the Friends of William Maxwell, a local group that I was a member of, and we thought it was important to let people and visitors know about William Maxwell, our native son, mm -hmm. and all of his contributions to American literature, not only the things that he wrote, 
but his extraordinary career as editor at New Yorker magazine. Mm -hmm. and, and you really can't miss it when you get into it. This is a good photograph. Um, this is in middle age. Uh, we don't have any of him as a kid in Lincoln, but this is him in middle age, and he would at this time been the editor at the New Yorker, I guess. Huh? Yes, that's a photograph from his daughter, Kate, along with a letter that she wrote uh, to be read at the dedication ceremony for the mm -hmm. bust in April of 2011. How nice, how nice. And above that, at the dedication ceremony in 2011, we're not going to read that whole thing, but I what I really like about this is that there's a quote there, and if you would, from John Updike, of course everybody has heard of him, yes. read that quote from him. This is a wonderful quote. Uh, they were best friends uh, for many years, and uh, John was quoted as saying, they don't make too many Bill Maxwells. A good editor is one who encourages a writer to write his best, and that was Bill, and yeah. that's the truth. That's really nice. And if we look down at your feet there, we can see him in his later years. Um, he changed a lot, uh, but still looking very studious. And look at that typewriter. Well, yes. you don't see those anymore, do you? No, but that's, <laughs> that's how he did it. In uh, mm -hmm. the last years when I either uh, spoke with him on the phone or received correspondence from him, still from the typewriter. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. David Welch, in addition to the, the plaque and the bronze that we, that we just saw, there is, of course, the plaque in the community, too, where William Maxwell's childhood home was. Um, and you, a principal of a grade school, right? Right. Um, are also a lover of William Maxwell's, Maxwell's work. Yes. So you were, wanted to be involved in this effort to get the plaquing done and to recognize him as a Lincoln is an extraordinary Lincoln individual. Absolutely. Um, and as we talk, we're going to show some of his work. But I was discussing with you, I just read So Long, See You Tomorrow. And, uh, and, and you have appreciated this book for a long time, haven't you? Yes. What is it about Maxwell that, uh, that you like? Well, one, he's a, he's a great writer to start with. Um, I think certainly underappreciated as far as great American writers go. Uh, also, just the amount of history that he puts into his books, history of Lincoln and Logan County that, that end up in his uh, works of fiction and memoir. Um, I think that's a real a treasure for the local community mm -hmm. to have. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to show So Long, See You Tomorrow. Now, this may be his most famous book. Um, it, was, it was written from the, uh, much of it takes place, all of it takes place here in Lincoln, doesn't it? Right. He's, I think he's like between five and 14 years old at the time this whole unfolds. Right. Um, it's a disturbing book because it's about murder, it's about divorce, it's about families breaking up, it's about isolation as a child. It's a very disturbing book. I'm thinking that he must have experienced some of this in his life. Yeah, absolutely. This is the book that won the National Book Award. Right, 1980. Yeah. So in 1980, he was, uh, gosh, he was not a kid anymore, was he? He was right. pretty, he was 60 years old or so, I guess. When we were he never came back to Lincoln, but he did, he did uh, communicate with you, didn't he? He did. Yeah, tell yes. us about that. Yes. Well, in 1999, I had written to him because the uh, plans were underway for the plaque on 9th Street at his boyhood home. Um, I sent him a copy of uh, Paul Gleason's uh, Pictorial History oh, okay. of Lincoln. Which is, which is right here. And uh, since that had a lot of history that Maxwell would be familiar with. And I also included in that letter uh, the idea of the plaque, and I sent along with him as well the, the wording of the plaque. Okay, that and that's, was, that's what we're looking at here, right? Mm -hmm, so right. this went to him. Right, it was a rough draft, and mm -hmm. I just wanted to know, um, you know, what he thought as far as the validity and the accuracy of, of what was written, and if he had anything to add. And he, like a, a great editor, he came back with a, a couple <laughs> edits for me. And um, so what he included uh, is what's in the final draft. Mm -hmm on the plaque. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a letter back from him to you. Right. Okay. And this was your original letter to him. That's right. Um, did, did you get the feeling that he was sort of enjoyed the idea of, of having his, his presence here in his home plaque? He did. I think uh, even more so than recognition of himself was that uh, his house was being recognized, his boyhood home was being recognized. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned that in his letter that it was still a home that was really dear to him, one that in his memory he walked through a lot. He said even the parts that weren't there, uh, the back bedroom or the summer kitchen, things that had uh, long disappeared, he still visited yeah. in, his, in his thoughts. Yeah. He, he, he wrote maybe a score of books, but, but in addition to that, and we've mentioned one of them, in addition to that though, I don't think you can underestimate how important a job at the New Yorker as the editor of fiction can be. Because sure. back, especially in those days, if you got your work featured in the New Yorker, 
that was one of the biggest deals around. Wasn't Absolutely, it? he yes. was a heavy, wasn't he? He was. He was. He was considered a great editor. Um, you know, when he was a, as a writer, he was considered a writer's writer. Um, and so the advice he gave as an editor, I think, was invaluable. And, and you know, you're talking some some really great authors like mm -hmm. Updike and J.D. Salinger, and so. Uh, and there's a lot of recognition out there for him yeah. for the work he did as editor. And you all have put together a pretty cool thing too. This is called William Maxwell's Lincoln, or, and uh, it's a self-guided tour. And this this is the places in Lincoln where he lived and played and walked around. And it's kind of cool to be able to went to church. And, and these places are mentioned in his books. They are, yeah. The quotes are given there, and the pages, in fact, they show up on, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you can check all those places out. What a nice experience, yeah. I guess you could get one of these at the library. If you happened into Lincoln, you could pick one of these up and spend the day uh, cruising around town. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank you, and thanks for your work on the plaque and sure. all that, and thanks for talking to us. Thank you. Following a trail of Lincoln authors brings you to the St. John United Church of Christ, where you'll see a plaque outside titled The Niebuhr Family of Theologians. Reinhold Niebuhr of that family is the pastor who is credited with writing the Serenity Prayer. Lynn Spellman, we choose to sit in the choir loft at St. John's United Church of Christ because back when this was the St. John Evangelical Church, when the Niebuhr family was pastoring here, these, all these pews that we see behind us here, they were in the original church, weren't they? So these go way back, and they're called the Niebuhr pews. Yes, actually that's a name I created mm -hmm. because in the original church, these were the pews that the Niebuhr children would have sat on to hear their father preach. Mm -hmm. And so obviously many other people sat on them too. Mm -hmm. But those were the most famous people. Yeah. Um, it's, it's too bad the original church isn't there because wouldn't that be a wonderful landmark to still have in Lincoln? Yes, it would be great. The parsonage that was built for the family is still there. So mm -hmm. that is one building we still have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, a lot of people that aren't familiar with theology probably haven't heard of the Niebers. But we're going to focus today on Reinhold Niebuhr because he was a well-known writer. And he had the distinction of writing a prayer which almost everybody recites um, whether they're a, de a devout Christian or not, they, everybody knows the prayer. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it first, and then I'm going to show it, okay? R Reinhold is credited, and we know that he wrote the Serenity Prayer. And the Correct. version that we know that is popularly known is, God grant me serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Now, he's credited with that. But that's not exactly the version that he liked, was it, or that he wrote? It is not. Um, he wrote this prayer in 1943 during World War II. Mm -hmm. And he wrote it while at his summer home in Heath, Massachusetts, when he was subbing for the local minister. And he cast it in the plural. So he said, God, grant us the... Um, let's Here you see. Go. Here you go. I'm trying to say, <laughs> God grant us grace to accept with serenity the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to know the one from the other. I see. Okay. To me, the most significant difference is not to change the things we can, but to change the things that should. Be changed. Right, right. Okay, so he became, he was already a famous theologian by the time World War II came around, wasn't oh, he? Oh, yes, he certainly uh, was. And he was ordained in, in Lincoln. Yes, he was. His father had died suddenly when he was in his last year mm -hmm. at Eden Seminary. And so he was brought home and um, preached the sermon his father would have preached. And when his father died the next day, he took over an interim pastorate and the next month mm -hmm. was ordained here. He was on the cover of Time magazine in, did we say 1948? That's correct. On the 25th anniversary issue of Time magazine. That is true. Reinhold Niebuhr was, was on the cover. He was that well known at the time. He was. He also... Um, won many national awards and was very involved in politics as well as religion. Is that he right? was the advisor to presidents. 
Now, he, here's a book of his essays and addresses, and this is a good picture of of Reverend Niebuhr right here. That's right. Um, but this just gives you an idea, he has many books to his credit, but this just gives you an idea of how well, what a, what a writer, what a, uh, an active writer he was. That's correct. His brother Richard, who taught at Yale Divinity School, also has a shelf of writing. So mm -hmm. we have quite a lot of Niebuhr writings here. There were enough, there was enough interest in him for at least two biographies. Here's one by a Ronald Stone, Yes. Um, which, which is a biography of, of Reinhold's life. And there's another one too that I'm going to show. But um, he, he was, he generated, he not only generated writings on his own, he generated a lot of interest. What was it about his teachings and, and his style that, that got attention? That's a good question. Um, he was extremely involved in national events. Mm -hmm. um, between the two world wars, he was trying very hard to get people internationally, especially the Germans, to see what was, what was happening and to oppose Hitler while mm -hmm. he could, still could. Here, his original pastorate, besides the interim here, was in Destroy Detroit, and he got active in strikes against um, Henry Ford, for example, mm -hmm. and other political issues. So people knew him not only for his religious writings, but also for his activism. And many people didn't even know he was a, a teacher of Christian ethics. Mm -hmm. They thought he was a political figure. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he had um, name recognition mm -hmm. on many fronts. He, his, his father founded came here and, and was a preacher here in town, had four sons, I think, four no, sons? four three children. Sons, three sons three and a daughter. Three sons and a daughter. And they all went into the religious life, did they? No. The, the eldest son became a photojournalist, but the daughter also, she taught at McCormick Seminary. Um, her father didn't believe in education for women, and so it was only after he died mm -hmm. that she went on and went to college and um, pursued her dreams. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, all but Walter followed the family business. And Richard's son also did because he became a divinity professor at Harvard for 40 years. I see. And his son became a religious journalist. So we have at least four generations yeah. of the family. This gives us a chance to swing around and get a, a, a picture of St. John's United Church of Christ. This is not the original church where the Niebuhr's uh, were, were pastors, but this is sort of the offspring of that church. And while we talk about Reinhold just a little more, he left, he went from here to, I think you said he went to Yale, did he not? Right. To study. Right. Uh, and then that started his journey of moving around the country to a variety of places. Where did he go right. after Yale? Um, he had a pastorate for a little over 10 years at Bethel Church in Detroit. And then for, I think it was 32 years, he taught at Union Seminary mm -hmm. in New York City, which was non-denominational. So he didn't just teach um, in his own church, but he taught people of many denominations, mm -hmm. including not all Christian, including mm -hmm. Jewish students. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, those were his two main employments. His brother Richard taught at, um, Ilmer, or at Eden Seminary where he had attended, was president at Elmhurst College where he had all atten also attended, and then for over 30 years at Yale. So, I have a couple of pictures. These are rather small, but they give us an idea of what, what this was the original church right here. Yes. And it was, I think, four blocks four from blocks where we are now here. in the new church. So when this new church was built, the whole congregation walked from one to the other. That's nice. That's nice. And this is a good picture, too, because this is, this in the old church is how they would have decorated it with so much greenery. Right. Much. Uh, it's remarkable, isn't it? And you can see that the German, the German words are, are you know, painted into the, uh, above the altar. 
Right. Reverend Niebuhr preached his sermons in German, as did Reinhold mm -hmm. when he was interim pastor Interesting. here. They began to move toward English. Now, while we're on this, let's also look at these ladies here, because this woman up in the up uh, standing here is Lydia. She was the mother of the, the three Reinhold boys, and what was the and girls? Hulda. And And Hulda, right, okay. Um, and she was also very active in the church. She was part of the she was part of the family business, so to speak. Right? She, right. she really helped run things. When Reverend Niebuhr came here, part of his job was to be administrator of the hospital, which was newly built um, by this church and the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. And Lydia was on the hospital board, as well as being church organ mm -hmm. uh, organist and. All those other things, Sunday school teacher, and now, so on. And, and Lydia and Rich was Richard the father. Was he the original? Gustav. G Gustav and Lydia are buried in Lincoln. Right, as and, well uh, as Holda. And the Holda daughter. the daughter. Okay, so so they came, and they stayed, and their offspring spread the word Actually, around the country. Actually, Lydia moved. So as soon as um, Reinhold was established in Detroit. She went to Detroit and helped him there. Mm -hmm. And then when he moved to New York City, she moved to New York City and helped him there. And then when Hulda moved to Chicago, she went to Chicago and helped her there. So Lydia outlived her husband for mm -hmm. about 50 years. And at all her time, she lived to 91 and her whole life, she was helping in mm -hmm. the church. Lynn, thank you very much. You're quite welcome. The physical school where Langston Hughes wrote his first poem had to go. It was too old and had to be torn down. But they have saved a couple of those bricks here in front of the plaque. And if you want to take this trail of authors in Lincoln, Illinois, a good place to get started is the public library where you can pick up a pamphlet which gives you a guide. With another Illinois Story in Lincoln, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.